Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards, bring you Lou Ayers in Margaret Cousins' A Letter to Mr. Priest on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present our dramatization of an engaging story called A Letter to Mr. Priest by Margaret Cousins. I came across this recently in a volume of best American short stories, and I think you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Miss Cousins' chief character is a country lawyer, and she does for that profession what other writers have done for the doctor and the schoolmaster. That is, she presents him as a human being, and in doing so, asks a question that a good many of us must have. What does real success in life amount to? For our star tonight, we are fortunate indeed to have that fine actor, Lou Ayers. As the story begins, Marshal Fannin, attorney at law, is standing outside his home in Fort Mason. From the mailbox, he extracts an official-looking envelope, and as he slowly walks back to the house, he begins to read a letter whose contents, well, our story will tell you in a moment. And now a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of A Letter to Mr. Priest, starring Lou Ayres. At Christmas, as on every memorable occasion, you'll take special pride in sending Hallmark Cards. Because just as for hundreds of years the word Hallmark has been the distinguishing symbol of quality, so today the Hallmark on the back of your greeting cards is your assurance of finest quality and perfect taste. It's a symbol of quality all who receive your cards will quickly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Margaret Cousins' A Letter to Mr. Priest, starring Lou Ayers. The class of 1917 of Franklin University will celebrate its 30th anniversary with a grand reunion on May 23rd, 1947. Your committee is preparing a commemoration brochure of this noteworthy class, and in going over our records, we observe that you were nominated then as the man most likely to succeed. We've somehow lost track of your activities, and we wondered if you would favor us with a report of your accomplishments to date to be included in our booklet. Sincerely, Adam Priest, Grand Reunion Chairman. Man most likely to succeed. <laughs> what a joke. What's that you said, Mark? Hmm? Oh, nothing, Joe, nothing, nothing. You look tired, darling. You've been working too hard. <sighs> Joe, it isn't how hard you work, it's the results that count. Joe. Well, I've been practicing law here in Fort Mason for over 25 years. Just what have I accomplished? What have I done for you? What have I given you? 27 years of happiness, Marsh. What more could I have? But I've really done nothing. Nothing but cause you to struggle through all these years as the wife of a country lawyer. But I'm through with Fort Mason, and I'm through with the law. Through? Why, Marsh, you're only 50. You're a young man. Well, maybe there'd be a chance somewhere else. Doing something else. Wherever you went, whatever you did, there'd be a chance. You're that kind of a man. But I don't really think you want to leave Fort Mason. Can you give me one reason why I should stay? There are many reasons. But I think you'll best find the answer within yourself, Marsh. It'll come from your heart. And no amount of talking will help. Hmm. I'll go and prepare dinner. Man most likely to succeed. Man most 
most likely to succeed. Funny, I believed it once myself. About 30 years ago, 1917, graduation day. Marsh, the world is yours. The man most likely to succeed, the most beautiful girl in the school in love with you. <laughs> I believe that if you wanted to be president, you'd wind up in the White House. Well, I don't know about that, Ollie. After all, I'm only 21, and how old was the youngest president when he took office? <laughs> I can't exactly say, but you could be the youngest. <laughs> Gee, thanks. Well, you know, Ollie, we're a team. You and I are going to build the most enviable record as lawyers this country has ever known. Now, we're going to New York and start from there. Garrett and Granger, the biggest law firm in the city, will fight for our services. No practicing in small towns for us. Now, wait, wait, Marsh. You know very well they've already offered you a job, and... I wasn't included in them. My boy, if they want my services, they'll take you or else. No, Marsh, I'm grateful, but... Well, and that's I... the way it has to be. Well, after all, we've been friends since we were kids. We grew up together. We've dreamed dreams together. Well, we're going to succeed together. Marsh, I, I couldn't. I don't expect to... Run. Just start packing, Ollie. We're on our way. Marsh, I... I wish in this lifetime I could meet one other friend like you. But that's asking for too much. I'm, I'm not that lucky. So long, Marsh. So long. Hey, you're coming with me. Ollie! Marsh. Marsh, I've been looking all over the campus for you. I should oh. think you... Hello, Cynthia. Well, what's the matter with you? You became a lawyer today. You're supposed to be happy. Well, I, I am. It's, it's just that Ollie... Oh. oh, Marsh. Marsh, don't let him spoil this day. Think about me, darling. You do love me, don't you? Oh, more than you'll ever believe. I'm going to give you everything. Everything that's as beautiful as you are. Well, I, I may have expensive tastes, Marsh, dear. Well, nothing will be too good for you if you'll wait for me. Forever, Marsh. Forever. Forever. A few months later, the Lusitania was sunk and we were at war. Cynthia? <laughs> She married a new minted Louis in a new minted Air Force. And I became a uh, private first class Marshal Fannin who spent nine months trying to convince my sergeant I was the man most likely to succeed. <laughs> and I did. He kept me digging trenches overtime. And Ollie, well, we never did get a chance to team up. He died. A war hero. And in 1919, New York would have been a very lonesome place for a discharged soldier without a friend. But the offer from Garrett and Granger was still good. And I couldn't wait to get started with my law in the big city. Only it didn't happen. My father was very ill. Hello, Pop. Oh, uh, I'm glad you're here, boy. The office needs you. Why, oh, that's nonsense. You'll be back in a day or two. You, uh... You like New York? Oh, yes, yes. I haven't gotten started yet, but it's a big city. It means everything. Opportunity, glory, achievement. I don't know that that's everything. Oh, well, Fort Mason's a pretty fine place. I never got rich here, but I've got a lot of friends. I've kind of liked being a country lawyer, Marsh. You can help so many people. Oh, every man to his taste. Yeah, you wouldn't be interested. I kind of hoped you would, I did need you here, but... You go back to New York. New York? Oh, it'll have to wait, Pop. And six months, Pop was dead, and I was a country lawyer. There are no prizes for accepting responsibility. Who can call that accomplishment? They say it's instinct, doing the right thing, and... Well, Pop's clients had to be served. There were other cases pending. There was no other way. Then in 1920, I met Josephine Burns at a picnic. Remember me as a kid, Marsh? I sure do, Joe. You live near Brewer Fork. Wrong. You must be thinking of someone else. Oh, I could have sworn it was you. Didn't you wear pigtails? Wrong again. Would it help if I told you I was riding a bicycle and, 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 and fell off? And you picked me up? Was that you, Joe? Uh-huh. You were my first crush. Imagine. I never quite got over you. To this day, I get the same thrill speaking to you. <laughs> You're foolish. Oh, no. If you don't mind my boldness, I'll admit no man has ever taken the place of my first crush. <laughs> Now, 
how can you dislike a woman who's honest and amusing and not too unattractive in her own way? I enjoyed going out with Joe to pass the time, but when I thought of a woman in my life, I, I was still thinking of someone as beautiful as Cynthia. I still visualized myself in New York, the great trial lawyer, triumphant in the accomplishment of justice, and, and then going out on the town and hearing people say, there goes the next attorney general. And that beautiful woman with him is his wife. Only one thing really irked me in Fort Mason, and that was that the people felt I was too young to assume their responsibilities. Well, it was late at night, and I was glooming in the office. It won't work, Joe. I'll have to wait about 40 years to be good enough for them. I can't get anywhere. They're just fools. They just don't know how wonderful... Well, they're right. I haven't made much progress in a year. Well, then why stay here? You've told me ever so many times that your future is in New York. There's nothing to stop you now. Joe, if a man can't succeed as a country lawyer, well, what chance is there for him in a big city? Oh, I don't know. You have drive and ambition. I'll prove myself here first. I'll be darned if I'll let these people lick me. That's the way I like to hear you talk. But about the people trying to lick you, now you're wrong. You shouldn't be discouraged because another generation doesn't take you on. Your day is tomorrow. I don't know what there is about you, Joe, but you make a man feel all warm inside. Couldn't be that I'm beautiful. But you are beautiful, Joe. To me, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. I fell in love with Joe. In those first years of our marriage, the struggle, the striving, the mammoth victories that now seem so insignificant, the depressing failures that now seem so thoroughly unimportant, and the power and the glory that goes with being the big provider. But clients weren't plentiful, and when the Mirrodin Oil Company called for counsel in a land title case, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. It was money, publicity, celebrity even. Yes, sir, Marsh. The documents are all on our side. We can force Bisbee to vacate the land in 30 days. It's just a matter of uh, interpretation of the law. Well, that's true, Mr. Snell. But there's a human factor to consider. How do we go about forgetting old man Bisbee himself? Now, that land is part of his body. After 20 years of scratching it with a, with a plow, grubbing it with his muscles, and watering it with his sweat... Uh, just two side of your own, man. It looks like I can't take this case, Mr. Snell. My interpretation just won't jive with yours. You're a hick. What? You're a high-grass Pollyanna. And I'm lucky I found it out in time. Goodbye. Well, don't forget your hat. Oh. Marsh. Are you hurt, Joe? Yes. We needed his money, didn't we, Joe? Yes. I'm sorry, honey. I don't know what came over me. You did right. I wouldn't have had it any other way. How many worlds would you have to search before you could find a woman like Joe? I don't think there are that many. And I wonder what I might be doing now if I had represented Mirrodin Oil. I might have been a very big man. And Snell was right. My opinion didn't matter at all. Old man Bisbee lost his land. Not a very bright move for the man most likely to succeed, was it? But I'm not sorry I took my stand. Just a moment, we'll return to the second act of A Letter to Mr. Priest, starring Lou Ayers. Last year, you resolved not to run out of Christmas cards this year, remember? Well, then you'll want several boxes of assorted cards on hand to complete your list and take care of last-minute additions. At the friendly store where you buy your Hallmark cards, you'll find Hallmark boxed selections in a wide variety of subject and greeting. For example, the Big Value Box gives you a wonderful assortment of 22 different cards for only one dollar. 
It includes formal and informal, gay and serious cards for individual and family use. Cards that capture the fragrance of pine, the jingle of sleigh bells in the Christmas air. Among the many Hallmark box selections are handsome sporting prints for men, magical winter scenes. The variety is endless. So look for the Hallmark on the cover of the box to be sure your cards have the Hallmark on the back. It's a symbol of quality all who receive your cards will quickly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. And now here is the second act of A Letter to Mr. Priest, starring Lou Ayers. You turn a job down because you let your heart dictate instead of your mind and you think you're the loser. Somewhere along the line, without any explanation, you find that isn't so. Suddenly, people become amiable. You make new friends and begin to gain stature in the community. New clients come with their problems and you're part of their life. But in 1929, I bought Joe a beaver fur coat. There's no way to explain what that meant in pride. Marsh! Look at it. Look at it. It's beautiful. No one else could look as beautiful in it as you do, darling. I wish I could have given it to you a long time ago. Oh, don't go talking that way. I wouldn't have appreciated it then. I love you, Joe. I bet you do. Else how could you spend all that money on a fur coat for me? Kiss me. <laughs> you know something? Your eyes match the color of the coat. Only they're so much more beautiful. Oh, darling. A long time ago, I used to say to myself, Marsh Fannin, you'll be the Attorney General of New York. Someday you'll be married to a lovely lady and you'll be so proud of her when you walk down Fifth Avenue. Well, Joe, I'm sorry I can't make it Fifth Avenue. But would you... Would you take a walk down uh, Main Street, Fort Mason with Marshall Fannin, LLD? Oh, my God. Yeah. Come in. Mr. Fannin, please, could I talk to you? Well, of course, Arnie. What's on your mind? I'd better leave. Mr. Fannin, is it a crime to be a foreigner? Well, I wouldn't know why. But others, they think so. I come from the old country. Soon I will become citizen. I work hard on my farm and my auntie, she work in the field with me. So why cannot I sell my crop? I don't know. Was there anything wrong with it? Oh, no. I go to market and no one will buy. I ask them why. No one will talk to me. I ask Mr. Braun, and he takes me away from everybody and tells me not to say who tells. It is just that I am a foreigner no one will buy. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. A man can't earn a living because he wasn't born here? I'd say, Arnie, that you're a better American than those people pretend to be. Well, believe me, we'll fight them. We'll weed them out. We'll give them a time. <laughs> fighting people who wouldn't come out into the open was as useless as, as Don Quixote fighting the windmill. We both lost. Someday laws would be written to punish intolerant people. And then I prayed with all my power that I'd be there to help write them. Marsh, if you'd only keep your big mouth shut, you could be elected to the legislature. Oh, now, Finnis, how can I keep quiet and run for office, too? Well, you don't have to go around yelling that there are some bad Americans here in town, do you? Makes people lose confidence in you. If people don't have confidence in me, I couldn't represent them very well, could I? Oh, Marsh, you're not being very practical. I want that nomination, Finnis, very much. You see, I'll be frank with you. I can do more about hate groups from inside a lawmaking body than outside it. Now, look, look, we're not a reform party. We play ball with people, and they play ball with us. You'd expect me to be a robot for the party? I couldn't introduce any bill without your uh, approval? Well, if you want to put it that way. How much respect do you think I could have for myself if I weren't forced to keep my principles within me? I became a lawyer because it gave me the opportunity of expression. And I refuse to be gagged. You're not cut out for my kind of politics. I'm sorry you just cost yourself your future. 
See you around. For the next several years, the crops failed and there was a drought. Times were hard and men even seemed to have lost perspective on law and order. I can remember vividly that, that hideous, suffocating afternoon when Joe and I were walking down Court Street. Not too far from us came the low murmur of men with the angry sound of hysteria. They were marching on the jail where a prisoner was housed who had committed an inexcusable and brutal crime. Wait a minute, men. Get out of the way, Pennant. I'd just like to say a few words. Pennant's going to stop us. You know where we're at. Men, you've got to listen. He ain't going to need Look, I've known most of you all my life. Now give me a couple of minutes. Listen to me. Listen to me. Please, please. This won't do any good, Marsh. Come on, let's go. Please, this is my home. I was born here. I live here, but wherever I live... I must first live with myself, as you must live with yourselves. So I have nothing to lose standing here. My responsibility to the fool inside those walls is no more nor less than my responsibility to you and all men everywhere. I never saw that criminal's face. But if you were able to look into mine and I into yours, I cannot run away. So if you take him, you must take me first. Now listen to me! Reason is the law of life. The law itself is nothing but reason. Without it, we're clods, and I appeal to your reason without which survival isn't worth the candle. Remember, the accused shall enjoy the rights to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. And if this is the law of the nation to whose allegiance we are sworn, then we must protect that law with our last breath. Therefore, how can we stand here and permit the sabotage of the American ideal? Better we go home and hide our shame. Mark, they're listening to you. They're listening to you. I know. There is reason in men. Thirty years in Rico. 1917 to 1947. What does it add up to? The dreams of my youth somehow got lost through the years. What has replaced them? You're a hick. You're a high-class polyander. And I'm lucky I found it out in time. Well, maybe you're right, Mr. Snell. But I know one thing. Money isn't everything. Mr. Fannin, is it a crime to be a foreigner? Arnie, it's your kind of man that's made this country what it is. I'm proud to have you as a neighbor. You're not cut out for my kind of politics. I'm sorry you just cost yourself your future. I don't know about that, Finnis. But I'll still fight bigotry till the day I die. And that's a pretty good future. Yes, sir. Fort Mason's a pretty fine place. I never got rich here, but I've got a lot of friends. I kind of like being a country lawyer, Marsh. You can help so many people. <laughs> I hope I have been of some service, Pop. I may have helped a few people. Old man Bisbee, for instance, it'd do you good to know I helped him get another farm. And, well, it's something to have people trust you. To come to you with their misery and say... I need your help, Fannin, and you're honest. Twenty-seven years of happiness, Marsh. What more could I ask? Oh, darling. called you old man, you wouldn't like it. Well, it wouldn't be true. You see, when you come into a room, I'm I'm just a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Sam Halls, he called. Said he's having a mess of trouble and needs your legal advice. Well, what did you tell him? Well, darling, I didn't know what to say. Things being the way they are. Well, what are you trying to do, Joe? Ruin my practice? Now, you just get him on the phone and tell him I'll be over as soon as I finish writing a letter. But Sam hasn't the money to pay you a what fee. What difference does that make? I'm so proud of you, Marsh. And you know why? You've always tilled your own acres, mended your own fences, tried to see that right was done. You've never made newspaper headlines, but you've done the really important things in life. Oh, I don't know, Joe. But thanks anyway. I do realize that progress is a very slow thing. And no man is too small to have his stake in it. I've got a big...
big stake in Fort Mason. Yes, Marsh. Yes. I'll call Sam Halsey. I'll call him right away. He just writes your letter. Dear Mr. Priest, it is very good of you to wish to include my accomplishments in the Franklin Commemoration Brochure. The class of 1917 indeed paid me a great compliment when they nominated me the man most likely to succeed. But you see, when the old gentleman looks at his medals, he finds they are so few and far between that they don't bear discussion. I'm just a country lawyer. There's honestly nothing to tell. This week, when you buy Thanksgiving cards to remember your friends on this traditional holiday, take time also to select the Christmas cards on which you'll want your name imprinted. If you'd like to have your card painted by foremost artists, look through the Hallmark albums. In the Hallmark Blue Book, you'll find many smart designs and novel features. Cards like the red and gold door knocker, cleverly cut out so your imprinted name shines through. And see the gay action card of a happy couple who actually pop up with cheery greetings. There are cards of vivid snow scenes, heralding angels, and Santa's so jolly you're sure you hear him chuckle. Or choose from the Hallmark Gallery Artist album of Christmas cards by Grandma Moses, Norman Rockwell, and many others. These are the personally imprinted cards you will send with pride. Your friends will display with pleasure. So look for the Hallmark on the cover of each album you select from to be sure your cards have Hallmark on the back. It's a symbol of quality all who receive your cards will quickly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. That was a wonderful performance, Lou Ayers. It's been nice to have you back with us again in the Hallmark Playhouse. <sighs> Thank you, Mr. Hilton. It's always a pleasure to attend the Playhouse in person or as one of your many listeners. You know your Hallmark cards and these fine programs help maintain Hallmark's tradition for fine things. Well, we sincerely hope so, Lou, and we always try to live up to that. Oh, I'd like to say to Frank Goss that the Hallmark Gallery artist's Christmas cards that he was talking about earlier certainly sounded intriguing and reminded me that I'd better get out and do my Christmas card shopping soon. And while you're doing so, Lou, be sure and ask to see the Hallmark box selections. It's a mighty handy way to be sure you'll have a card for those last-minute additions to your Christmas card list. I'll do that, Frank. Oh, Mr. Hilton, what's the play for next week? We hope you'll all be with us next week when we celebrate the traditional holiday Thanksgiving with David Niven, starring in The Courtship of Miles Standish, a story that all of us treasure because it captures so well the true feeling of that day. And the following week, we have Miss Bishop, starring Martha Scott. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our direct producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and our script tonight was adapted by Jack Rubin. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Lou Ayers will soon be seen with Teresa Wright in the forthcoming RKO picture, The Capture. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present David Niven in our Thanksgiving Day story, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Courtship of Miles Standish. And the week following, Miss Bishop starring Martha Scott. And the week after that, Elizabeth Arnhem's Christopher N. Columbus on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC.